tell me what's going on for you and how I could help. Um, well, I am signed up to take the um, May LSAT. So that's next month. Um, I've been studying on and off for a year and I'm really hoping that um, next month will be my last. Sure, sure, of course. No, I, I hope so too. And studying for a while, obviously, most of your prep, I imagine, was oriented towards a five-section in-person LSAT on a tablet. Now it's three sections at home. Right. So I have like a, pro a question about that probably towards the end. But yeah, the, so the questions that I have are like, so just like some specific towards the sections. And then the last one will just be about like the technology. Um, yeah, sure. Shoot. Feel free to ask away. Awesome. Um, so the first question I had is in regards to logical reasoning. Um, so the question type that I'm getting consistently wrong is the flaw question type. And so I, I went through your videos and specifically the one on flaw, um, on the flaw question type. And then you kind of talk about how there's like three ways that um, the questions are worded in terms of um, like identifying the flaw first. Um, I can just pull it up. So like one way is like, which one of the following most accurately expresses a flaw in, in the reasoning or the reasoning in the argument is flawed because the argument X, Y, Z, and then, or the argument is vulnerable to criticism on the grounds that it. So um, what you were saying in the video was like, they're all the, it's all, all, it's all asking for the same kind of answer. What is the flaw? But I feel like the wording of the question still trips me up, specifically the second one where, it, where it's asking um, the reasoning of the argument is flawed because the argument and then the answer choices go into kind of like how the argument is flawed, not specifically identifying the flaw, but what the argument is doing to be the flaw. So I'm wondering if you had anything to kind of add about that. Sure. Or, yeah. yeah, I mean, when you're describing the flaw, the argument, is guilty of. That is the same thing as identifying the flaw. I don't really see much of a difference there. I understand if you really get into the weeds of textual analysis, you could see slight differences in tone or perspective, but they really are just driving at flaw. What is a flaw? And those for all intents and purposes of taking this exam, those types of question stems are all equivalent. Mm -hmm. Right. So I guess like the way to practice that would be to just kind of review the list of flaws and just keep, ans um, keep practicing that question type. Well, you've been talking about question stems, which is just how, what, what they're asking you to do, knowing the, prop, the task at hand. So your task is always in the ones you described, identify the flaw. Simply that. What you then just asked about was regarding like classic logical fallacies and reviewing lists of those. And that could certainly help you, but that alone isn't going to be enough because the LSAT is not only testing classic logical fallacies. It's also asking you what the argument fails to consider, and in other cases, what the argument takes for granted. So a, flawed, a potentially flawed argument might be something like, we should go to that restaurant. After all, it has five stars on Yelp. That's not a classic logical fallacy because the ancient Greeks did not create a list with restaurant reviews through an app in mind, right? That's just the flaw of assuming that five stars on Yelp is sufficient reason to go to a restaurant above all other reasons and all other considerations aside. Like, do we like that cuisine? Is the restaurant conveniently located? Or most directly attacking the flaw here would be, are the reviews reliable? How many reviews are there? Are the reviews of a representative sample that is also similar to me and my preferences? Right. So what you're saying is that there's like a slight distinction between kind of the list of fallacies and what might be actually a flaw. That the, list of, the list of fallacies is simply one, one way for you to familiarize yourself with a good number of the flaws that the LSAT tests. So that's a partial solution to becoming familiar with LSAT logical reasoning flaws, but that alone isn't enough because many flaws or many, and many arguments are simply where the LSAT is taking something for granted 
or failing to consider something that is unique to that particular argument. Okay, yeah, I think that might be something that I'm kind of tripping up on because I'm looking for the fallacy, whereas what the question might be asking me for is like, what is the, a stimulus missing? Um, yeah, and then they also have their unique applications as well. Like you could know what a correlation causation flaw is in the abstract, but that might not be a lot enough for you to recognize it when it comes up applied to a particular situation. Like we lowered the speed limit and car accidents reduced. Did the speed limit lowering cause that or was there some third factor? So you still have to recognize it in context. And that's why memorization alone isn't enough. You actually have to look up specific examples of each of these flaws to see how they play out on the LSAT. Mm -hmm. Right. So kind of related, like another way that I'm getting like flaw question types wrong is that sometimes I'll read the stimulus and I'll immediately peg it as like a particular flaw. Oh, this is like an ad hominem ad hominem flaw, obviously. And then it turns out I'll get it wrong. And then uh, it'll turn out to be like a whole to part flaw. So I'm wondering if you have any kind of thoughts about how better to like catch myself um, in terms of identifying what is the right flaw. Well, this, this again, I think comes back to the idea of looking up specific examples of each classic fallacy as it shows up on the LSAT. And I actually have a list of just that on my site, the LSAT blog, where I went through a dozen or more classic logical fallacies, and then I found specific prep test examples of those. And mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll send you a list of those and include them in the link below this video as well so folks can check it out. But basically the idea is make it real for yourself. So ad hominem, of course, we know attacking the person, not their argument, but there was clearly a part of whole thing going on there, if that was the correct answer in that case. And so I think knowing specifically what crosses the line to become an ad hominem attack versus in which situation is the person's specific characteristics actually relevant. In some cases, referencing a personal characteristic may actually be extremely relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, so slightly like on a related vein, so parallel flaw questions, would you say that's pretty much the same? You just have to identify the flaw. What is it, what is it that the argument's missing? And they just find in the answer choices something that does exactly the same or is there something a little bit different to parallel flaw questions no, it's, it's, parallel. yeah it's pretty much what you just described yeah okay. so it's id id the flaw so same as a regular flaw question but then with the extra step after you have formed an abstracted idea of that flaw in the like in a sense like a general principle you then have to apply it to another situation so there's a there's a it's a two-step process there which is why those could be more time consuming, like any parallel questions, more time consuming. So the first step is rec simply recognizing the flaw for yourself. And if you don't see the flaw, I wouldn't even move to the choices yet because the choices likely aren't going to help in that case. Slow down and find the flaw and thoroughly understand the stimulus first. Right, the flaw being something that the argument is overlooking or like a fallacy. Yeah, so something, either it's a classic logical fallacy or they're overlooking something. I, I use the phrase failing to consider because that's what the LSAT does too. And then alternatively, they could take something for granted. So in the Yelp example I gave, they, we could be failing to consider that Yelp reviews are biased or unrepresentative in some way. That they're, that they're, or they're taking for granted that the reviews are a reliable indicator. Mm -hmm. Right, and the, actually the failing to consider questions are the ones that trip me up, actually. Yeah. So failing uh, to consider simply means that they are neglecting some possibility, oftentimes. Right. All right, uh, cool. I think, I think I'm done with flaw question types. Sure. <laughs> uh, so kind of shifting gears into uh, reading comp. Um, so... Where I struggle with reading comp is with comparative passages. And so um, like my approach to it has been, I read like one of the passages and then I go to the questions. And then after I like answer as many questions as I can based off that one passage, I go back to the, and I read the second passage and then I finish up the questions after that. And so um, like one thing, like I'm trying to figure out an approach to comparative um, passages. And one thing that it reminds me of are like the disagree question types in LR, where there is, or any kind of question type in LR where there's like two stimulus types. 
I'm trying to make a connection there, but I'm one, but um, I'm still working on it. Um, are there any kind of takeaways, would you say, that I might be able to draw from like LR2 stimulus types um, to like my approach to comparative passages, or should I just like think of comparative passages on their own or? I would think of them separately because point at issue questions or point of disagreement questions, there's one clear point where one person would say yes, the other would say no. But in dual or comparative passages, they're not directly at odds with each other a lot of the time. They're usually not overlapping entirely, but the point where they do overlap is not always a yes-no distinction. There could be a difference in their emphasis sometimes where one example would be one passage A talks about insects and passage B talks about bees specifically. Mm -hmm. But they're not always going to be at odds. And in fact, a lot of the time they're not at odds. So I, I don't see them being quite that similar. I think the logical reasoning connection to reading comp is really more in question types where you have a strengthen or weaken or parallel in reading comprehension, which oftentimes becomes much more time consuming. Right. I'm noticing that there are kind of like ways to cut time with comparative passages. Like they tend to, they tend to be like uh, more simpler in terms of the content in each of the passages, uh, in each of the paragraphs of the passages. So maybe there's like less analysis to do there. Um, but okay, sounds good. We'll know. Uh, so kind of the last question that I had was just in regards to the technology aspect of the digital um, version. So, um, right, like I'm t um, taking the LSAT in May, so we'll be taking it at home, and I understand that we'll be using ProctorU. Yeah. And so I've never used the program before, but I'm I am concerned that like my computer might act up, like notifications from like the Wall Street Journal, just like random like pop-ups that I've subscribed to. Um, so I'm wondering if that's something that I should kind of account for prior. Like, should I make sure that all of my notifications are just like off, my text messages are off, um, or will Proctor you somehow kind of account for that? Like, does it like shut down the rest of my system, or what? What would that look like? Yeah, so they'll shut down everything else on your computer. And either they'll prompt you to do it or they'll do it automatically. I'm not sure of all the details quite yet. I have a lot of open questions with them I'm waiting to hear back on. But speaking of notifications and text, I would also, of course, make sure that your phone is silent or off or in the other room. And there's no way that your phone is going to interrupt you also because that's a separate device. Their software can't account for that, of course. And if things are interrupting you, at the very least, that would be a distraction. So I actually tried like a, um, a practice LSAT on like the Law Hub, like so the recent, the one, I, yeah, the way that you can like practice online, um, it's supposed to like imitate what will be the actual. And so would you say that would be like a pretty accurate way, accurate look at what it'll look like on the on ProctorU? Yeah, so the official LSAT Prep Plus on Law Hub is the best way to simulate the digital LSAT format, whether you were going to be doing the digital LSAT tablet in person or the online LSAT flex. Either way, the format's the same and that's the best way to prep. Yeah, except the big difference being for LSAT flex, do three sections, not four. Skip the logical reasoning from the prep test in the prep plus. Right. Um, awesome, that answers all the burning questions that I had. <laughs> awesome, Jasmine, glad to help. Uh, before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um, I would say that um, definitely I had a lot of questions about flaw questions because those, those are the question types that it's consistently I am getting incorrect. So I think um, being better able to analyze the stimulus um, for what assumptions are being made or what's being overlooked or failing to consider and making that distinction to focus on that alongside fallacies. So that would be like my biggest takeaway. Fantastic. Well, keep in touch and let me know if you need anything as you move forward. Awesome. Thanks for this. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.